Thank you for joining us on our Tuesday edition of Frontier Opening Bell. With us this morning, we've got Chima Okadike, Consumer Goods Analyst with Vertiva Capital Management and the Executive Editor and CEO of Frontier Africa Reports. I'm Temple Ashadjo. Thanks a great deal for being a part of the program this morning. Quickly, let's look at the state of the market on our menu. We've got Nigeria Stock Exchange down yesterday by some 0.20% uh, due to some profits taking level. The BRBM in Ivory Coast, which represents the Francophone markets, continues to tailspin by some 29 basis points yesterday, which was Monday, the beginning of the week. Egypt, the stock exchange there was marginally positive, 0.04% on Monday, and Kenya got a 0.40% decline on Monday, so 157.56 points. And finally, with Johannesburg Stock Exchange, in spite of the level of delisting that we've been seeing on that boss, it was positive yesterday by some 26 business points on Monday. Now let's look at the uh, headlines from um, eastern part of Africa, beginning with Kenya, where the China Exit Bank $1.4 billion loan is due this Thursday, January the 21st. And of course, UAP Insurance beating its peers, CIC, as well as APA, APA Insurance, by gross premium, uh, with, by gross rating premium, uh, I understand that settled up by some 8.3 percent. Zimma Zinga is now Kenya's Britam Holdings' new chief executive officer, and that is to take effect from February the first of 2021. Now, opposition challenger Bobby Wine is to challenge Museveni, uh, the incumbent president. At the, uh, for the victory of the election, uh, which took place last week. Finally, Uganda Communications restores internet five days after elections. Bosin, you're the man here to speak to the Eastern African markets, all of these headlines that we've got from that space. Uh, quickly, what do we know about the China Exim Bank $1.4 billion loan, uh, which is due on Thursday? Is this something that will get the uh, executives of both ends, of both parties rather, talking again? Uh, before this due date? I, I think I'll just uh, uh, comment on just about two uh, of those. The first one was the China uh, uh, Kenya uh, eczema. That $1.4 billion is due next week, Thursday. So um, Kenya's fiscal unsustainability level is now at all time high. If you look at the currency yesterday, the uh, shillings also went back, down back to about 110.9 from 109.30 to the dollar on friday so there's a whole lot of pressure on the kenyatta's administration in in nairobi to uh to, to 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 get the economy up and running remittances are coming in nearly four billion shillings on a daily uh, basis throughout uh, most of last year so a whole lot of kenyans outside in diaspora are sending money in but as everyone knows there's a whole lot of tough line for the administration to fix this uh, fiscal imbalance with the loans coming through this 1.4 billion dollars relates to uh, one of the railways that was being uh, that was built uh, uh, with the chinese um, export import bank loan we have a similar problem in nigeria here one of nigeria's newspapers the guardian today has a very front page lead story that railway projects in nigeria about 100 percent higher in terms of costs than the average cost uh, stipulated under the infrastructure program of the African Union. So between Nigeria and Kenya, citizens are asking questions about, are these projects competitive? Are they well contracted? Were they competitive bidding? Are they commercially viable in nature, rather than so projects that are, look very sexy and nice and politically correct? rather than infrastructure, especially railways. We need to think about this railway issue in Africa, because again, unless you're doing railways between Lagos and Abidjan, stopover in Accra, Togo or so, in which folks who are trading, okay, who are traveling can pay competitive rates, commercially speaking, in country becomes a little bit difficult because by nature, we're agrarian, we're agriculture in nature in Africa. So, and we're used to land transportation, and we're not going to pay any heavy, uh, 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 you can't toll a railway line. The only thing you can depend on is the ticket. So I think uh, African leaders will have to rethink the whole railway uh, 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 thing. If, if you do an intra-city metro line in Lagos, for example, you'll make your money. If you do it in Kenya, you'll make money within the city because folks want to move from one end of the city to the other and what have you very quickly. But some railway projects become very difficult. And, and the second issue relates to the um, Uganda communications. Now, 
uh, on freezing internet five days after the elections. Just imagine how much this country has lost by shutting down the internet for five days. Mm -hmm. Or more than that. In fact, five days after the election, it was shut down before the election. So if you add one or two, three days before the election, they shut down internet for more than a week in a whole country. That does not make uh, economic and, and, and business sense. And imagine the telecommunication companies and other providers, how much they have lost and how much it will mean translating to the their bottom line and also the bottom line in terms of tax for the government as well. I don't think political leaders in Africa need to rethink that. You don't need to shut down the internet. You don't need to shut down the social media space. Once you do good governance, then you don't need to be afraid of who is coming after you. Nece not necessarily. My, my views. Thank you. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting, Bosun. Thank you so much for that. Let's move now to West Africa, where there are in Nigeria, uh, the House of Reps, um, public hearing on the petroleum industry bill is due on January the 27th and 28th. That I know that a lot of analysts and our journalists will be tracking. Are uh, Still with Nigeria, Discos, that's the distribution company's revenue collection, rises on CBN directive uh, then you go to the stock exchange and we look at this corporate story uh, we had listed name it pharmaceutical companies raising some five billion naira to reposition um its books and of course it's affairs then ghana shipping agency holds some fees uh, to help importers and of course traders uh, uh chimma let me come back to let me come to you quickly with the uh a stock exchange story, name it, is a company uh, that is a, is a pharmaceutical company. It's now raising some uh, 5 billion naira, and I know that you are a consumer goods analyst. Uh, what do you know about this development? Um, thank you, um, Tempo. Uh, you're right, name it is a pharmaceutical company, and they have been making some strides in recent times, um, really, and the... Um, but I say the COVID situation, the COVID-19 situation kind of helped to boost um, some of their operations and the way investors viewed them um, being, I think, one of the few um, pharmaceutical companies listed on the NSE. Um, if we look at their performance for last year, year to date, they gained about 260% um, percent year to date, which is very significant, although it is a... Um, uh, low price stock i don't really mean uh, the penny stock i, I think trading at two naira 23 cobble um currently from zero naira 40 from 40 cobble um last year um but however this year we've been seeing we saw that um stock has lost about 10 percent year to date we could say that it is a reaction um from investors um based on the high profits it had um the high gains that accumulated over the past year and investors are just taking profits at this time or it could also be um, that people are reacting to the news of um, a possible dilution of their um, shareholding in the stock so um, I, I think that we should continue to expect that people will continue to take profit on the stock for now at least the short-term players um just on setting of how the um their earn share earnings would um, look like in the future but for long-term gainers which is what the company is kind of really looking should really be looking to um giving its um ideals and the, its expansion plans and all the um, development plans it has in store for 2021 and beyond um i think they would stay put and i think that they should be able to see some um some decent returns on their investments given that COVID-19 has really put a spotlight on the need for health and we should continue to see that need displayed um, in the near future. Uh, so what do you think about um, <laughs> the distribution company's revenue, revenue collection which is now beginning to shape up uh, given the CBN directive uh, at this point? I think that this should have this was expected um because for one it was able to plug all the cages from the revenue collection methods and so the news that was beginning to see a lot more um, efficient revenue or gross revenue i think it's expected um now according to the discourse um they say that the invoice that the at school i read they say that the invoice that the transmission company sends to them is different from what they actually um transmit and so they normally just 
make such adjustments before they transmit before they um submit such revenues to the government now we don't know like how exactly that works or how what exactly the truth is but if that is the case then it it doesn't seem exactly fair to disclose that um they are if they're being made to um take the fall for any shortages in transmission that may be occurring so i think that what we need and i think this is a point Boston has made earlier is a general framework that is just best just takes everybody into consideration if the point if the plan is to raise um tariffs let's raise tariffs if the plan is to inject more money into the transmission um company so that we can get better transmission lines or get better generation because it's just a three-phase more than a three-phase problem but in every step of the every step of the way we have challenges Generator, generating companies have challenges, the transmission companies have challenges, the discos have challenges. If what we need to do is to um, inject more money into, um, more capex into the gen codes so that they can provide, generate more electricity or make more transmission lines so that they can carry electricity or give the discos um, the ability or forex or whatever they need to be able to provide meter so that they can um, rely less on estimated billing and be able to know what exactly each consumer is consuming and be able to charge their monies fairly then or if we need to increase tariffs as they have been fighting for then i think we just all they all just need to sit down come up with a very profound framework that fits the needs of everybody and then i think the problem would kind of be solved i couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more to my uh, totally but bosin uh, is yes. it really collection that is to be celebrated here or the fact that there's been a little bit of hike in the tariff well uh like uh, chima said see, the, the entire electricity sector value chain in nigeria is in the one humongous mess is <laughs> all wobbled like spaghetti in hot water you know how it looks like it's all wobbled all around. You can't get it straight. So you, you need to do something. I don't know what we can do. So, uh, see, I, I, we can't inject anything into anybody, whatever form of money, whatever, until we clean up the mess. And Chima just make that an illusion. When you send bill, customers talk about, at the end of the value chain, talk about crazy billing. And then the disco says that the TCM, which transmits, or we send, also send crazy billing to them. So the you also, also just paid whatever they can. So, but again, between the discos and the Jenkos and the TCN, the entire value chain, I, I think with the exception of the gas providers, the government is a shareholder. So the government have shares in all the disco, 11 discos. So I think about 30, 35%. For the Jenkos, government owns about 40% or so. And I think that's why they brought in the central bank to go in there and try to help clean up the mess as it were. I guess that was why the central bank came up last year with all those very lengthy regulations and whatever with the banks and what have you. Because it looks like everybody's just doing whatever they like. And because government is a, it's still partly government business. So the, the civil servants, the whole mentality is still that government is a shareholder. So let's just do government will always give us money. We'll always get bail out, whatever it is. If it is wrong, like GT Bank or Access Bank or Vetiva Capital, I tell you, you will get value for money in 24 hours. You won't find all this. Nobody's sending any crazy billing to any customer. You get it sorted out. Then, because government is also the regulator, it becomes very difficult for the regulator to be, quote and unquote, forthright or can stand its foot down the way the central bank would do with the banks. So it becomes difficult because NRC is owned by the government. Then you have TCN owned by the government. Then government have shares in the discos. What do you have? It's, a, it's a still a whole mess. So we need the entire full privatization. Government needs to get 100% out of the electricity sector and allow the private sector to run it so that we can see the full valuation. We can know what we are paying. You can be proper enumeration of customers, buildings, offices, shops, everybody pay as you go. It's simple then we can know what the true value of whether we need to raise tariff or we're even paying more. For example, if I live, live in a three-bedroom flat and you send me a bill of 40,000 naira per month, hold on a second. I'm not doing mining inside my three-bedroom flat, by the way. I'm not mining gold or silver. So why would I use 40,000 in a month? Even if I turn on all my electricity uh, appliances for 30 days a month, there's no way I could have spent close to 40,000 in a month. <laughs> Let's move on.
<laughs> I, I, I know what you're talking about, Bosin. I mean, I feel that pain. I am lucky to have gotten that now. And uh, since I got it, I have, I have only uh, reactivated with just 12,000 Naira. And I tell you, for the, in the last 30 days, that's 30, uh, 12,000 Naira, rather, uh, worth of units. And that 12,000 Naira has not even been... Uh, you know, exhausted because again, you know that the electricity is not really regular compared to the thirty thousand naira that they bring as estimated bill. You know, at the end of the month, I mm. understand that fully well. <laughs> Let's move on to the Southern African market, where South Africa is now looking to tweak its budget, uh, raise some taxes, and of course, cut spending for vaccine. Uh, Joiners Box Stock Exchange been plus uh, six uh, positive by some six point nine seven percent, leads the BRBM, which is down by nine point zero four percent, and of course since 2021 began that is uh 20 uh the brb brbm uh, uh stock exchange uh js on the jones box stock exchange still elb a construction company to be the listing uh, in february on virus impact on the construction sector and of course uh the multilateral development banks uh dfis which will be development financial institutions mobilizing some 175 billion dollars private finance in 2019 uh, says uh, EBRD, the European uh, 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 the Development Bank there from European. Uh, so basically, uh, quickly, let me get your uh, thoughts on this, um, Chima. Uh, exactly what do you think about how South Africa in recent times has been fighting this uh, issue of COVID-19 vaccines? They're targeting some 40 million individuals to be uh, inoculated before the year ends, some 20 million by half year or thereabouts. What are your thoughts on these developments and that climb? Thank you very much, Temple. So um, with regards to South Africa, I can say that um, they've cut spending for their vaccine and um, they've also um, raised tax and... Oh, wow. We just lost the connection to Chima there. Uh, we hope yeah. we'll get her back. But Bosin, let's have you pick on this story. Okay. Before I, I, think, I think this is it's tough right now for South Africa. The economy has been in, in the doldrums, as it were. So looking for money to pay for vaccine is very, very uh, crucial. They are likely going to raise tax. They are going to... I, 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 put, I put a post out yesterday on, on my LinkedIn that about this payment for tax, for raising taxes to pay for vaccine or what have you. And I got more than 1,600 views. And I saw some responses. South Africans are just head over heels. Are we going to get paid? Are we going to be sure that if you raise taxes, that you're going to use the money to, to pay for the vaccines? So folks are short on money. They lose their jobs. They have the unemployment. There's no massive unemployment benefit or whatever. Things are hard. Then you want to tax them more to pay for the vaccine. Well, they need to stay alive. But Absolutely. this trust deficit is there. Are you sure? That the money will go there. Nigeria is budgeting 10 billion, I guess it's a 10 billion naira for vaccine production, what have you. There's a whole lot of money gone down the drain if you look at Kenya, South Africa, corrupt practices in terms of contracts for the vaccine and the uh, uh, personal equipment, protection equipment, the PPEs when the first wave came last year. So there's a whole lot of problem, a lot of investigations going on in Kenya. You don't have the head or tail who's been convicted or what. In South Africa, some of the issues were also there about some of the contractors. So it's, it's, it's a little bit murky water, so the virus and the vaccine right now. So it's, it's legitimate for South Africans to begin to ask questions that how, how would this, if you tax me, how am I sure that that tax is going to go into the vaccine? Big question the government in South Africa will have to answer. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, it's good to know that we have Chima back now. Chima, just before we run out of time or before we end the show, do you want to talk on the uh, Giannos, the Johannes Box Stock Exchange, which has continued to be positive in terms of um, its indices? And of course, the uh, uh, decline we are seeing in BRBM, coupled with the fact that uh, a com couple of construction companies on the Johannes Box Stock Exchange in recent times have been delisting due to the implications or impacts of the coronavirus in that sector, construction sector. Um, thank you, Temple. Uh, apologies for the um, network issues. Um, so um, I think that the, so the GSE, um, like the Nigerian equity market, has been seeing positive gains um, because when you look at this region, um, the, the regions that investors are really um, mainly focused on would hear um, Nigerian markets, the South African markets, um, and <clears throat> given that we're seeing a lot of um, vaccinations and a lot of hopefuls, hopeful news 
about vaccines and the economy is um, people are, many people are hopeful about the global economy and the, um, the dollar is rising. I think we, we will continue to see um, favorable sentiments for this for these um, for these markets. Now, with regards to the construction company that is um, that's planning to delist from the from the GSE, um, we know that the COVID nineteen pandemic was a very serious hit to many construction companies. Um, many people had to lock down for a while, and that definitely affected. Um, we've known that the biggest hit was the hospitality sector, but um, direct, uh, indirectly, we can also see that, uh, that it has affected the um, construction sector. So I, I'm not very familiar with this particular firm, but I think I can understand the general idea behind the, um, the listing if we're not able to make as much as we can, if we're not able to continue to um, to uh, finance our operations, and we're not seeing a lot of returns based on the, the challenges that we have seen in this past year and looking forward, we're not seeing how we can recoup that in a short possible time, then um, I think the best thing would be to um, preserve um, shareholder wealth and just, you know, do what they think is best. I mean, that's, that's, that's the reason why they actually signed up to the buyout uh, uh, op option or alternative that they had. Uh, let's wrap up the show now quickly with the North African market, uh, where Somalia is now looking to reverse the plan to scrap Chamber, chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Middle East and North African paid TV revenues will keep falling, says uh, Digital TV Research. Uh, Qatar Airways yesterday resumed flights to Cairo on Monday. And Alexandria is to come on stream later after uh, the key uh, political uh, figures in uh, of uh, Bahrain, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Co. Uh, reached a truce on their political differences. Uh, so uh, let's look at this uh, together. Uh, uh, Chima, which is your peak on this man who, uh, I mean, Qatar Airways uh, has resumed flight to Cairo now. Uh, how much of economic impact is that likely to have in that uh, hemisphere, given your macroeconomic uh, knowledge of how things work generally? Um, so definitely it would be a, a very um, good development for the country, given that it is now um, opening up more to businesses and there's now a, a free, freer flow of people and probably goods um, in and out of um, Cairo. So I think it's a very, 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 um, a very good development for that region or that country. Um, case in point is when we had to lock down for Nigeria and we saw how it affected the airline industry, the airline sector in Nigeria, and how it even also affected businesses because people could not go um, across the country and people people were shut down. So we know that um, the the online meetings and virtual um, virtual meetings were able to sort of hold in place for non-physical, for the lack of physical meetings. But I don't think it's quite the same if, you, if you're a businessman and you need to check on your project that's happening, physical project that's happening in another part of the country and you're unable to because you're unable to get on a plane and get into that particular region. So definitely in terms of when you look at um, flow of business, flow of people to that, to that, um, particular region, it's very, um, in, there is a post development for the economy. And also when you look at the airline itself, in terms of business operations, it is definitely um, a very good development for um, Cairo, for Qatar and Cairo. Network, network, network again. Thank you so much, Chima. Bosin, what's your final word for the day on the Northern Markets? Northern uh, I, I think the Tunisian uh, a violent protest for uh, for the 10 year adjustment revolution, which brought in democracy, is one issue being reported by all the international news media, Reuters, and others. I, I don't think Tunisia can do a whole lot can do a whole lot more peaceful uh, political and economic environment rather than allowing so much of uh, uh, violent protests since the days of uh, President uh, Abdulaziz Bouteflika and the whole rest of the. It goes way back. 10, 20 years that they haven't been able to have political stability in Tunisia. And they just need to get their acts together in, in that country. A new administration government was trying to settle in. They're trying to bring in a new cabinet that will be more technocratic in nature and allow the foreign political parties to sort themselves. So this new administration, which is like an interim 
uh, government should be allowed to get the economy up and running with the pandemic and the whole problems in the world. I think they can do less. This is just an anniversary. And they turned into violence in about five cities. The images were not uh, very good. Uh, their neighbors, Egypt, getting their acts together. Morocco is getting their acts together. Algeria is there as well. A bit of tense political situation also there as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Boston. I mean, we note that some 1,000 people yesterday were arrested or thereabouts in Tunisia. This is not something to really celebrate because of the history of violence and, of course, uh, uh, um, uh, unsettled political uh, 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 terrain that we've seen in that country in recent time. It's high time uh, the sits together, sacks together, and, of course, uh, you know, resolve all of these differences. Thanks a great deal, Chimba Okadike, consumer goods analyst with Vetiver Capital Management, for your analysis on the show this morning. Boson Omofaye, the executive Thank director, or uh, executive editor, I beg your pardon, of Frontier Africa Reports. Thanks a great deal for your thoughts as well. I'm Temple Ashajo. This has been Frontier Opening Bell. You have yourself a wonderful day. We'll see you next time.